So what's a state of the college address all about? In part, I think of it as kind of the pep rally before the opening game. And there's excitement in the air, and we have the self-confidence and the, the excitement of being a winning team. And I see myself as the cheerleader in chief. Um, but it's also a little more serious than that because we have to talk about our successes tempered with the, real, the reality of the challenges that we face and because we need to have a somewhat serious conversation about our goals and aspirations. And, and this is a really auspicious year to have a conversation about goals and aspirations. For one thing, we are embarking on a comprehensive self-study to prepare for reaccreditation by middle states. And thanks to Kim Miller and John Haas, we are very well organized to do that. And um, if you are a co-chair or a member of a committee, can you raise your hands? So as you can see, a huge percentage of uh, the campus is already involved in that self-study. And those of you who are not directly involved as yet will be involved either by giving information to the committees or giving feedback as we draft the chapters or simply being here when the team comes and able to answer questions. So we will be communicating everything that goes on in that process to the entire campus. And it is one of the most important things that a campus undertakes. And it's also an auspicious year because we have a new strategic plan called Charting the Course. And I am going to use the strategic plan as a framework for my remarks today. I'm not going to do it exactly in the order that we did it, but I'll use it as a springboard for the discussion. Uh, one of the things that we did in formulating this plan uh, was engage in a year-long process, and many of you remember our planning day last January. We tried to be as inclusive as possible, uh, to look inward, to be introspective, uh, to focus on critical strategic issues, and to also think about how will we assess what we do. Um, to build accountability, and also to think about our desired future state. And we went through both an internal and an external process to get there. We have a new vision. Chesapeake College will harness the talent and resources necessary for students, employees, and citizens of the region to thrive as individuals and as contributors to their communities and to society. And I think for today's purposes, I want to stress that students come first, but employees are in this vision statement because we need to grow and learn and develop and thrive. Because if we don't, then clearly our students won't and the people we serve won't. And we need to be very thoughtful about how we do that, uh, whether it's professional development, the President's Leadership Fund, how do we support sabbaticals, you know, how do we support our own learning and growth in order to be the best at serving students. We also have a new mission. So if a vision is literally what we see in the future, the mission is what do we do? What were we founded to do and what do we do? So our core commitment is to prepare students from diverse communities to excel in further education and employment in a global society. We put students first, offering transformative educational experiences our programs and services are comprehensive, responsive, and affordable. The college is a catalyst for regional economic development and sustainability and a center for personal enrichment and the arts. We do not use the word transformative lightly. We, in fact, transform students and their families and their communities and ourselves. I was talking to David Harper this morning. David uh, participated in the National Outdoor Leadership School this summer, and I said, how was it? And the first word he used was 
transformative. We have a foundation board member and we were going around the table and saying, okay, why do you volunteer your time to be on the foundation? Why are you willing to go out and ask people for financial support for Chesapeake College? And he said, um, because when my wife was 50, she shocked me by walking into the room and saying, I've decided to be a nurse. And he said she came to Chesapeake College and had a life altering, transformative experience. I think we don't always know that. Um, we teach, we help students at the counter, they leave, and we don't realize the extent to which we have transformed their lives and their children's lives and their communities. So I think that that word is deliberate and important for us to keep in mind. Here we go. We have six strategic goals, growing enrollment, improving student goal completion, strengthening the regional economy, advancing environmental sustainability, transforming the student learning experience, and building the resources to advance the college mission. And I don't think these are in the order that we are publishing, and my remarks are not going to be in, in the order we are publishing where transforming the student learning experience is first, but I'm gonna do these kind of in the order that I thought of them as I was making my notes and, and what made sense to me in terms of the flow of these remarks. So the first thing I want to talk about is growing enrollment. And two issues emerge out of this, one is if we are going to transform people's lives, they have to find us, they have to get here, we have to be able to serve them. And I use here uh, almost metaphorically because they don't necessarily have to be here, but we have to offer them what they need. And because enrollment is a significant budget issue. Last year we had an enrollment decline of, I believe, about 11%. And then when we were building this year's budget, we said, okay, that's over, we're gonna build based on the actuals from last year. And in fact, we've had another enrollment decline. We think that when we open, it will be approximately 5%. And that translates into $609,000 in decrease in revenues. $609,000 that we did not predict. Now we're very lucky that the state actually gave us more money than we budgeted, um, about 479,000. And ordinarily that gap, that $130,000, would not be that difficult for us to make up. We always have savings that we didn't anticipate. We have um, searches that take a while, and so we have some payroll savings. There's always something. But this year, we also have some expenses that we didn't anticipate. And one in particular, in our IT area, we have some vacancies, and quite honestly, we can't fill them at the salaries that we are used to paying. Um, IT is a world uh, unto itself, and we need to compete with other colleges and universities, with private entities here and across the bridge, and we can't do it. And we're looking at some alternative solutions, outsourcing uh, certain projects, and the cost of that is uh, way above anything that we had built into the budget. And we have other uh, expenses associated with the HPAC, moving, storage. So this year, that makes making up that gap particularly difficult. And another thing we did last year, we looked at our spending patterns over the last five years. And we traditionally didn't spend uh, all the money we had budgeted, even in our very, very small amount of discretionary money after compensation and after contractual expenses and utilities. You know, we only have a few million dollars that we actually get to decide how to spend. Spend, and we were routinely giving back about 12% of that. And so we said, okay, if we never spend it, we don't have to give it in the first place. And we took almost half of that away. So we've already made so many cuts, 
We don't have many places to go. And in fact, the only place we really have to go is people. And in the entire recession, we never cut hours, we never cut people, and I don't wanna go there now. So we really need to look at enrollment. We need to make sure that we are doing every single thing that we can uh, to serve every possible student. And this is, not the job of the recruitment dean and her staff or the retention dean and her staff. It doesn't fall on someone whose title says enrollment management. It has to belong to all of us. And we've already done some really wonderful things in this area. In fact, at the beginning of, of registration, we were down double digits. I, I think I remember Rich coming in one day and saying 22%. And after I got up off the floor, um, I thought, how are we actually going to manage this? Uh, for one thing, we've done phone campaigns. And again, that wasn't just student services staff. That was the business office, everyone in the Dorchester building, faculty who came in. And we managed to call almost all of the people who were here in the spring and didn't come back. And, and talk to them or leave messages for them, and that made a huge difference in, in enrollment. And we need to keep doing things like that. These, these have to be cross-divisional efforts. We have now a cross-divisional team of people, I'm hoping I get this right, the Academic Enrollment Planning and Assessment Council, it was we had an enrollment team and we had an academic planning team and we realized they absolutely have to go together. It's co-chaired by Kathy and Rich. And they're looking, among other things, at new programs. Um, exercise science, sports management, landscape design, biomedical. Uh, we need to give people what they need. We need to make sure we have the right programs. We need to make sure these programs are of the highest quality. And then, of course, we need to let people know that we have these. And every one of us, every person in this room is an ambassador for Chesapeake College. Whether you're having a conversation in the supermarket, you're standing in front of a classroom, or you're out there in a high school or other setting recruiting. You represent this college and, and we, I know, need to do a really good job, perhaps a better job of communicating among ourselves so that we all know what we offer. Uh, but we need to be out there telling people who we are. And we need to, to make sure that what we do is the best because now when a student has a negative experience, it's on Facebook, it's on Twitter, and it isn't just their parents or their friends they're telling, it's exponentially could be hundreds if not thousands of people. So they, they tend not to put the, I had the best class on Facebook, they put, I can't believe that that person is teaching, or I can't believe how rude somebody was to me, and they don't talk about all the wonderful things. So we need to make sure that there aren't any of those negative experiences to get out there. We have, uh, as Rich said, stopped the bleeding in terms of enrollment, but that's not good enough. And we have a really ambitious goal to get back to where we were at the height of the enrollment surge, and the recession drove a lot of students to us, and get back to 3,000 students. And what that gives us is the flexibility to do new things with those increased revenues. It will be a challenge. It isn't something that's going to happen in the first year of the plan. It's something that will happen over time. It's a, a really intense challenge. We know that the high school population is declining. And this is part of a national trend. This is not Chesapeake College struggling with this. I was at Washington College yesterday to welcome the new superintendent of Kent County. And I was talking to Mitchell Reese, the president. And he said, their enrollment is down. It's making the headlines everywhere. I'd say out of the 16 community colleges, one or two are up and everyone else is down some percentage from one or two to 13 to 15. So we're not alone, but we have to take care of our community. And our next goal is completion. And of course, completion goes hand in hand with enrollment because if you keep the students you have, if they are retained until they reach their goal, you have less work to do to get new students. 
We are already seeing results in the things we're doing to help students realize their goals. The 2004 cohort had a 17% completion rate, and those are students, first-time students, who earned either a degree or a certificate within four years. So the 2004 cohort was 17%. The 2008 cohort is 27%. So we're already seeing dramatic increases in our ability to help students achieve their goals, or in this case, the goals that the state is measuring, which are not always the same. Uh, many of you have been involved in the redesign of developmental education. And again, this is an example of cross-divisional collaboration. Now clearly, the majority of the work is the faculty who have to think through the curriculum and the pedagogy. But when they do that, and they change the way the course is offered and the way students progress, they have to involve the business office and financial aid and the registrar because it changes everything about the process and it isn't something that can be done in a vacuum. Um, it's still evolving. It, it probably, I, I hate to say this in front of um, Courtney and others, it'll probably always be evolving. Uh, one thing they're doing this year for the first time is mandatory advising. And the other day, Eleanor was sharing how well that was going and how exciting it was. And one of the things it does for me is it says so many times we think of something and people go, oh, well, students won't do that. And, and probably a lot of people were thinking, oh, students won't do that. Well, you know they are, because we're telling them that they have to. And I think we need to think more broadly uh, about some things that need to be mandatory rather than suggested. Of course, that does put an obligation on us to create multiple forums and most multiple modalities, because we can't simply say this is mandatory and it's Monday morning from 9 to 12. Um, students have families, they have jobs, and mandatory will work, but we can't make it too narrow. We have many, many services that benefit students, and clearly the Academic Support Center is, you know, one of those shining stars, and when students find them, they pretty much move in. Um, and you hear this at commencement and in surveys, you know, I, I wouldn't have done this without my tutors. I wouldn't have done this without the people in the academic support center. But one of the issues is when you tell people that that's available, they don't necessarily get there. So to what degree do you make the phone call while they're sitting there? Do you literally walk them across the campus and say, here, let me introduce you to one of our tutors? And the question is, what What's the balance and how do we move students from being supported to being independent? And I use the word supported instead of hand-holding because I was interviewing a candidate the other day and I used that phrase and she said, you know, there's really a, a pejorative sound to hand-holding. We always say, oh, well, you know, we don't do that hand-holding. And it reminded me of a colleague of mine who uh, went to teacher's college at, the, at Columbia University in, to earn her doctorate and, you know, they get there and one of the professors says, we don't spoon feed you anything here. And so the students themselves got together and formed a study slash support group and they called them spoon feeds. And they got together on Friday evenings for a spoon feed. And so we need to, to understand that there is some hand holding at the beginning. We, we assume and the law says that every student who comes here, except maybe dual enrollment, is an adult and they need to be treated like that. Well, adults need some support throughout their lives. We, we don't go it alone. And so I think all of us need to think through the degree to which we tell people about the support they need to complete or we literally hold their hand until they get there. So we, we need to help students complete their goals because it's the right thing to do. Students don't come here saying, oh, I think I'll stay for a year and drop out. They come here and they say, I will stay for X amount of time and I will transfer. I want a certificate. I want a degree. And we have a moral obligation to get them to that point. 
But it isn't only the right thing to do, it's something we are held accountable for. Uh, Performance-based funding is probably, in this state, inevitable. And that means that there will be a completion measure or multiple completion measures for which we will be accountable. The community college presidents uh, met two weeks ago and we were looking at our legislative agenda and high on our list is making sure that those metrics are reasonable and that performance-based funding does not become punitive. And I will tell you that the first model being proposed by the P Department of Budget and Management is to take a percent of our base funding and set it aside for performance-based funding. And what that means is that the colleges with the hardest to serve students and the biggest challenges will probably lose funding just at the time when they need it to redesign, to implement new services. And so we are going to advocate for completion measures that make sense and for incentive rather than punitive funding. And we have already written a white paper on that. We are working with MHAC uh, to try and make this process uh, as helpful, if one can use that in the same sentence as performance-based funding, as possible. I will tell you across the country, there are literally no examples of performance-based funding that work. Um, accountability is important, but the formulas, they don't work, and what happens is states implement them, and two years later they have to do it all over because it simply doesn't work. Uh, so we all have a responsibility for completion, and I have a responsibility to be in Annapolis to say you need to be supporting students at community colleges. That same candidate that I interviewed told me it took her seven years to get her associate degree uh, because she was raising two children. And every year, I hand a diploma to students who've taken five years, seven years, 12 years, and they are as much of a success as everyone else, and we need to make sure that there is recognition for that. Our next goal has to do with economic development. One of the things that's really important about including this in the strategic plan is that it creates ownership of the whole plan, really, by the community. This is an issue that everyone in our community cares about. You know, when I go out into the community and I ask people how they've been touched by Chesapeake College, almost everybody knows somebody who's been here for a credit class, a training program, a uh, recreational opportunity. But the biggest group of people who get it are employers whose employees have been here for one reason or another. And we ourselves have a huge impact on the economy of this region. In fact, we are one of the largest employers after Shore Health and after the school districts themselves. Every dollar that the public puts into Chesapeake College yields $2.90 in increased taxes and avoided costs. And these, these numbers come from a study by an organization called EMSI. They were commissioned by all of the community colleges last year, and so we have local numbers and state numbers. And I have um, taken this on the road a little bit, but as I go around this fall to all of the counties and all of the chambers, I am going to integrate these kinds of numbers into our uh, my presentation on the strategic plan, and as well, many of them are in our uh, case for giving, which you will get an opportunity to see soon. Uh, so we are 3.2% of the regional economy. We put $18 million a year into this economy. And if you are a student, for every dollar that you spend here, you get $6.20 back in increased income. And it takes you about six years to recover the, the cost of your education, and you get a 24.6% average rate of return when you invest in Chesapeake College. So if you're a student, let me repeat that, 24.6%. And if any of you can tell me someplace else where you get that rate of return, I will tell you it's probably illegal. So. <laughs> So what better investment is there than education? And this is something that we have to 
convey to the community and in particular to the people who fund us over and over again. And when we did this study, it left out the, one of the biggest economic development projects we have, and that's our new building, the Health Professions and Athletics Center. And many of you may not have seen this yet. These are two views of the outside. And in the top view, you see the gym pretty much as it is. That's the brick wall. Um, this is a view, the top view is, is pretty much from the Dorchester building. And so the outside of the gym is gonna stay the way it is and nothing else. Um, so the big glass, the two-story glass uh, structure right in the front corner, that's the fitness center. And so those of you who are proud of the way you look on a treadmill can get out there and have everybody watch you. Um, you know, especially at night when the lights are on inside and there aren't any lights outside. Um, and along, along the front are, uh, the front of that section next to the fitness center are the athletic department offices. And then um, the other brick that you can see is where the infamous swimming pool is, was, it's no longer in use, and that's gonna be a big multi-purpose room. We will actually all be able to sit in one place, uh, not quite this big, and have our planning meetings there, and have uh, external organizations come for conferences as well. And then if you look at the bottom view, which is sort of as you're coming into the campus, the solid areas in the front, those are all uh, health professions labs um, in both directions, actually. And the reason they're solid is that uh, in the nursing labs, for example, you have beds against the wall and you can't have glass walls. Um, and they are truly going to be extraordinary. And when you look at this building, and this is not the absolute final design, but it's pretty much the way it's gonna look. Think of how this is going to change our campus. When you drive in, the whole vista changes, and it's going to be absolutely beautiful. And we have some interior views. Uh, this is the first floor. Um, and whoops, that was the first floor. Let's go back. or not. This is the second floor. You notice the roof plaza. Um, I, I don't know if the nursing faculty are fighting over those offices yet. Uh, but that, the second floor is where all the labs will be and a conference room for the athletic department overlooking the, the gym where they can uh, do some recruitment. And the labs have all been designed by the faculty who know how they need to be used with some consultants. They've done field trips to other places. Uh, this will truly be a place where we can provide the best possible education to our students. So very exciting. And we need to think about it both as a, a source of pride, an opportunity to transform education, and a huge economic development project. This is a $37 million project, and although we can't say that every dollar is spent here, a lot of dollars are spent here. Uh, the, the architects, the contractors hire local people. We know that from past experience. We also know that approximately 400 jobs are involved in this project. So uh, you, uh, if you haven't already gotten it, you will get the save the date and invitation to groundbreaking on December 4th, that's a Wednesday. Uh, classes will still be in session, I think it's the last week, and so we're hoping the health students will show up in their uniforms and the student athletes will show up in their uniforms and we'll all show up in whatever we feel like wearing. Um, and of course, uh, and the, our special guest that day will be Brian Billick, who is the honorary chair of our campaign. Yes, Susan. Uh, and uh, as Susan certainly knows, former coach of, of the Ravens, he's really a very nice person and very eager to support our campaign. So uh, it'll be a big event, an exciting event, and, and then the headache of construction will actually start. So the other part of economic development is clearly what we contribute to workforce development. And a couple of weeks ago, I was at a that president's meeting I told you about. There we go. And I saw this quote, the single most searing, clarifying, 
helpful, world-altering fact. What the world wants is a good job. And that is very true of this community. And Jim Clifton, who is the chair of Gallup, who wrote the book, The Coming Jobs War, he goes on to say, as jobs go, so does the fate of nations. Jobs bring prosperity, peace, and human development. But long-term unemployment ruins lives, cities, and countries. And I think we see this here in our service region, where we have um, chronic unemployment, you have deserted streets, you have crime. Uh, job creation, job development is essential to the future of this region. And we as an educational institution, especially a rural one, face this puzzle of how do we participate in this because it's hard to prepare students for jobs that aren't here. On the other hand, businesses won't locate here if they don't have people prepared to do the work. And uh, I was at a rural college before this. I know that, that there aren't any easy answers, but we have to be part of job creation here on the store and job preparation. And this, this applies to both continuing education. Again, this is not one of those things where we say that's their job. This is everybody's job. Because we are talking about both short-term training programs and the credit programs that take longer and prepare people for certificates and degrees. And either way, those are very often just steps in a path. Um, whether the student is an arts and sciences student and transfers and, and doesn't get, enter their career path for many years or whether they get their CNA, uh, their certified nurse assistant and start working immediately and then use that as a vehicle to nursing or other health programs. Either way, career paths are long and as we now know, uh, varied, that very few of us get a job and stick with it for many, many years. We move around and I don't remember the figure of uh, what percentage of jobs our students are gonna take have not been invented yet. Um, so. We, we need to be giving students the kinds of skills they need for that pathway and for the multiple jobs they are likely to hold. So lots of people are working on this and, and thinking about what does this mean. A representative from the American Association of Colleges and Universities uh, spoke to the presidents at that meeting and talked about liberal education. And this is something they worked with employers to develop and took this definition out to employers and said, well, if your child was getting ready to go to school, what would you want? And this is what they said. This is what we'd recommend for our own kids. Liberal education is an approach to college learning that empowers individuals and prepares them to deal with complexity, diversity, and change. Those are the kinds of skills you need for a career path. You may not need them for the first entry level job, but you need them as you think about your lifelong career path. We also saw a presentation by a representative of College for America. Now, this is something that was started by Southern New Hampshire University and uh, I was once on a panel with the president, Paul LeBlanc, and uh, called him up and, and said, you know, the presidents would really like to hear about this because I read that they had just been approved by the Department of Education for financial aid for a competency-based program. So it's not credit-based. Our students are eligible for financial aid when they register for a certificate or a degree that has a certain number of credits. There are no credits attached to this program. There are 120 competencies. So I, I called Paul and he said, oh yes, you want to hear about my modest little endeavor, the College for America. But what really took me aback is when I found out that the degree that got approved was an associate degree. And so that made me sit up and take notice because in some ways, 
This is our competition. And what they did is, and this is going to look very familiar to faculty because this looks just like general education. Uh, they looked at an existing associate degree in business and said, here are the kinds of skills that students need when they get a degree in business. And you will notice that most of these skills have nothing to do with content. They have to do with critical thinking and communication and quantitative reasoning and ethics and social responsibility. They look a lot like what AAC and you came up with for liberal education. Um, but there is a content area and it's important to remember that that content area has to prepare students with the skills and knowledge that will work in the workplace. Now, one interesting thing about this degree is none of us can register for this degree. It is only done through the workplace. And so College for America has partnered with FedEx and Panera and employers like that, and they offer that to employees. They make it easy for them to pay for it. And by the way, it costs $2,500 a year, materials and everything included. It is an online program. The students have a learning coach who um, is at a distance, but they also may have support within the organization. Uh, they do individual projects, they do group projects, and as they move through the program, they demonstrate a competency and they either have mastery or not yet. Um, there, are no, there are no grades. And their first, they now have their first graduate. This program is only six months old. So what it means to me is that um, if, if Walmart had this, Panera has it, other companies, you know, we don't have a lot of these big employers on the shore, but the person who might have gone to their community college now has this easy access to a degree supported by their employer who, who may be offering them education benefits, may be helping them in, in many ways. And that student's going to look at this and say, it's cheaper and it's easier. I didn't say it was better, but it's cheaper and it's easier for them to do. And we need to know that these things are out there. Um, I, I expect, and they told me within a year, they'll be offering a bachelor's degree. And I have to believe, given Paul LeBlanc's entrepreneurial spirit, eventually they will also make this available to the public. So we're gonna talk in a little while about online learning, and I don't wanna get into a debate about it. This is out there and it represents a new choice available to our potential students. But I also thought it was really important to show you that people are thinking about broad-based competencies rather than content. So our next strategic goal is environmental sustainability. And I see this as related to many of our other goals. It's certainly related to economic development. Uh, at the College Council retreat last week, when we were going over the strategic goals and talking about what our individual contribution and our department contribution would be, uh, this will be shocking to most of you, uh, Greg Farley got up and said, but this is the most important strategic goal. But really, the case he made uh, was that we live in an area that is extremely threatened by rising sea levels. So there's not going to be a regional economy because there's not going to be agriculture or tourism or the quality of life that we expect if the sea level rise continues the way it has. And I was sharing with him front page of the science section in the New York Times today uh, talked about a panel report which Greg said is actually not new, but it, it certainly was a headline today that said, with 95% certainty, human beings have caused the sea level rise, um, or certainly the rate of sea level rise, and therefore we do have it within our power to mitigate against that that rise. So this is an economic development issue, a quality of life issue. I also see it related to enrollment as we build a pipeline uh, from the high schools where environmental literacy is now a requirement, the public schools, to the four-year degrees in many areas, science and law and, and politics. And, and I think students care about this and they do understand that they have a, responsible, a responsibility and we need to involve them in it. 
And now we get to the heart of a college, and that is the learning experience. That's what we're about. Um, we did give everyone a copy of The One World Schoolhouse by Sal Khan, and faculty I know will be talking about that tomorrow, and we will be creating opportunities for all of you to talk about it, and I wanna stress, uh, this is voluntary. Uh, I hope that you will read the book. It's, it's a story. It's, it's not a technical book, it's not a textbook. It is a man's story of his journey from helping his cousin do better on a math test to offering videos in pretty much any subject you can think of to millions of people around the world. And Kathy and I had an opportunity to hear Sal Khan at the American Association of Community Colleges National Convention last spring, and he essentially told the story of the book, but also with some videos that were very powerful of people who were using the Khan Academy. And I have to say, I had never heard of the Khan Academy until our book board had a retreat maybe last year or the year before, and Matt Hogans, who's a board member from uh, Kent County, said his kids were using Khan Academy to supplement their classwork. So when they had homework, they went home and they used the videos. So one of the things that I like about this book was uh, I think you know by now, I like big, bold, audacious goals. And Saul Khan's big, bold, audacious goal is a free, world-class education for anyone, anywhere. Let me say that again. A free, world-class education for anyone, anywhere. So, big enough? So then, what I also like is that he talks about the crisis in education, and we are assaulted pretty much daily by uh, news about the crisis in education. And what Khan says is that um, this crisis is not about text, uh, test scores and, and uh, standardized exams. It's not about graduation rates and test scores. It's about what those things mean to the outcome of human lives. It's about potential realized or squandered, dignity enhanced or denied. And I feel that that is so much a part of our mission. You know, when community colleges were first founded, they were called democracies colleges, and, and I was sharing a, a quote yesterday from the Truman Commission in 1947 uh, with our new employees, where the commission talked about both the, the potential of education for individuals, but also for our country as a whole. So the, the notion of access that had never existed before uh, benefited the individual, but it also was intended to make better citizens and to improve our democracy. And that could be a topic for a whole other uh, conversation. Uh, I want to stress that this book and this conversation is not about technology. Um, it exists because we have technology we never had before, but that's not that's not the story. It's about learning. And, and I don't want to get into a, what I think is a false debate of, should it, you know, is online learning better than face-to-face -face learning? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. But what is that learning? What were those slides about when they talked about personal skills and foundational skills and, and content? And that's what he is challenging us to think about. Uh, yesterday I read an article about MOOCs, Massive Open Online Courses, uh, written by a community college person who has written a lot about MOOCs but had never taken one. And so he took one. And at the end of the article, he talked about the really good things from that course. For one, he said, it was organized in small chunks of time because brain research shows us that most people learn in about 15 minute chunks and then they need some time to do something that, that imprints that learning and they need to apply it in some way to answer questions about it, talk about it. And, and of course, the speech isn't like that and we don't teach like that. So the, but the MOOCs do, in at least the one he took, it was small chunks of content followed by questions and opportunities to assimilate 
the learning. And then he said what it didn't do was give him an opportunity or a challenge to argue, to debate, to evaluate. Now that doesn't mean it couldn't, because there could be online exercises that do that, but it didn't. And so that it leads to these fundamental questions about what is the role of the teacher in the learning process. Um, you know, our students go into shock when they go to College Park and other places and they sit in a lecture hall this size and they're one of 300 people, but we still call that face to face. Um, we don't have that here. We have small classes, we have opportunities for, for dialogue, but we have to ask ourselves the question, if we claim there's an advantage, what is it and, and how do we organize it? What is the essential role of the teacher in a time when content is available anywhere, anytime in your pocket? So we, we don't have the exclusive knowledge anymore that we used to have. So I urge you to read the book and let's get together and talk about it. I also had the opportunity to see a presentation by somebody from Apple. And when I saw that on the agenda, I was thinking, oh, a sales presentation. Well, two things. Uh, first of all, his name was John Landis. He's a chemistry professor, and I am hoping to have him here at some point. He was the only presenter in two days who used no technology whatsoever. So he, um, he did occasionally take his phone out of his pocket and say, I have all this content here, or he pointed to his iPad, but there were no PowerPoints, there's nothing fancy. He just told stories, and he told stories that, that provided a context for us to think about teaching and learning. But he said something that, that was really powerful to me. He started by talking about knowledge revolution, and he said, well, the first knowledge revolution was the Gutenberg Press. And before that, you had to be a bazillionaire or a member of the clergy to have access to written words, to, the, to books. And then, of course, came the press, and it opened up a whole new world, which did take, however, hundreds of years before books really became accessible. And, of course, that sparked the Renaissance and, and lots of other political movements. And um, then he said, three years ago, they invented the iPad. I was shocked. I just kind of thinking, oh yeah, five, six, ten years ago, three years ago um, was, was the iPad. So we are, and we are aware of this, in the middle of another knowledge revolution. And he looked at us as I'm looking at you and said, we are the only people in the history of the world who have experienced pre-connectivity and connectivity. Some of us pre-connectivity a little longer than others, but we remember, we remember what it was like before there were smartphones and before there were tablets and before there was the internet. And before there was all of that, you had to come to one place to learn from an expert with a textbook. And now you take your phone out of your pocket and you don't necessarily learn, but you can look things up. And what we need to think about is what is the difference between looking something up and learning. And he was very powerful. And it kind of uh, recalled for me Art Levine, who was the president of Teachers College. I'm thinking in the 80s or 90s. He was doing the circuit, and he was giving a speech. And I heard exactly the same speech over and over again. And what he said was, he was talking about the stress then of change because we know the only constant in life is change. And he said, well, do you think the people in the Industrial Revolution got up in the morning and went, oh, it's the Industrial Revolution, no wonder I'm stressed. <laughs> and I can do the whole speech if you'd like. Anyway, we know we're in the middle of a revolution and it's stressful. We are having to question the things we learned, the way we do things, and it's stressful. We get up in the morning and go, it's the knowledge revolution. How am I going to be the best possible educator I can be in the middle of this revolution? And we joke about how soon they'll be implanting chips in our wrists or whatever, and they're not jokes. 
as fast as we can think of them, they happen. So we really need to think about what is our role. And, and everything I've been looking at lately says the role of the teacher, of the faculty member, is contextualization and problem solving, is getting students together to engage in meaningful conversation and solve real world problems. And that's what that whole list of competencies was about, was students getting together to solve real world problems. And by together, it could be in a classroom, it could be in a study group, or it could be in an online community. The new buzzword is flipping the classroom. And what that really means is that students learn the content, the facts, the dates, the dosages on their own using resources like Khan's videos, um, resources that are structured around how we know that people learn, which is in small chunks at their own pace. On the hammock, at the kitchen table, in the library, it's really not relevant. And what are we going to do now to accommodate that not new knowledge. Well, it's not new. It's been around since I started in higher education. We know how people learn, and yet we routinely ignore it. And it also reminds me of the world is flat, and it's, I think, related to our economic development goal, because what Thomas Friedman said is, any job that is based on content alone, we can outsource. But when it's based on critical thinking and, and personal communication, we can't outsource it. So the healthcare professional may use knowledge uh, that comes online and may even send x-rays to India to have someone read them, but when it comes to talking to the patient and helping them understand, you can't outsource that. Our final goal, whoops, is advancing the college's mission. So we can't do anything I just talked about if we don't have the resources. And that may mean more staff, different staff. It, mean, it, it comes down to dollars. We've had a great year in terms of grants. We got a, the Maryland College Access Challenge Grant. We actually got our third grant this year for $108,000 to um, increase the embedded tutoring to do orientation. We got a Who Will Care uh, Maryland Hospital Association grant to redesign a gateway nursing class for $250,000 over three years. Uh, we just got a NAP Foundation grant to upgrade the wireless in the LRC. That was $25,000. And most recently, we got an early college grant. That's the Upper Shore Early College Initiative from the Maryland State Department of Education for $122,000, and that is to work with Caroline County to have dual enrollment, particularly in a biomedical area. So it has to do with recruiting the students and then designing a degree for them, and it's possible that we'll get $140,000 in addition to scale that program to at least one other County. So uh, we need to keep thinking about sources of funding. Uh, I think in the past, people would come up with a good idea and say, oh, too bad we can't do that. We don't have any money. And now I'd like you to think, I have a great idea. Who might be interested in funding that? It's not an automatic process. It takes a lot of hard work. Uh, but you can see the kinds of things we have been able to do when we went outside for resources. And another way in which we, we're doing that is a capital campaign. Our strategic plan is called uh, Charting the Course, and our campaign is called Setting Sail. And we have begun by soliciting foundation board members and board members and senior staff on campus, and we will be coming to all of you. We have one of the best track records in the state of internal giving, even through the recession, even through times without raises. Uh, the campaign is difficult. These are still tough times, and we're meeting with people who say things like, you know, five years ago, 
I would have given you $100,000 easily, but I haven't been selling lots or houses, and, and I just don't have that income. But the good news is we are getting larger gifts than we've ever gotten before, and that's part of our goal is to build the relationships with future donors, and we are asking people to please give the largest gift you've ever given to Chesapeake College. And so we are launching that primarily to support equipment for the new building that the state doesn't cover, but also to increase our scholarship endowment. We know what a difference that makes to students. Sometimes it's a really small scholarship, but it covers the gas money or the book money, and it's vital to their success and also to create a technology fund for students because we, we can talk about all of these exciting tools that are available and for some of our students, they're simply out of reach. And so we don't wanna to say to students, you know, we, we want you to learn using this exciting new tablet and, and they can't afford it. So we wanna be able to put technology in their hands. And a big piece of advancing the college's mission is simply telling our story. Um, and by the way, check out my Facebook page, which, um, thanks to Laura, <laughs> is now updated on a regular basis. I do the content, she does the, the posting. In fact, she told me I was no longer allowed to post. Uh, but, uh, you know, we, we need to get the word out. We do not want to be the best kept secret on the shore. We want to be the jewel in the crown that we know we can be. We want to be an institution that people know and brag about and support. At our last Pride of the Peak, we honored Harry Rhodes, who was instrumental in founding Chesapeake College, and he said, we have done more for more people in this area than any other institution on the Eastern Shore. So Dr. Rhodes knows it, we know it. So let's be proud of it and let's tell everybody else. So have a great year and I would be glad to answer questions or stick around, but thank you for listening for a really long time, I know. And um, I, getting back to the pep rally, I know we are a winning team. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.